I gave up a 10 year career to become a professional dude in a room. Which is all well and good now, but why did I take such a ridiculous risk? Well, let's talk about the thing I did for 10 years. That thing that allowed me to live before I threw it all away to become a whatever this is. And to do that, we've got to go, we've got to go back. I never knew what I wanted to be when I was in high school. And it was always very awkward because I went to a private school and everyone around me pretty much had a career path set in stone from the age of like 13. They were all gunning to be doctors, lawyers, politicians, economists, all that sort of stuff. And I just, I just didn't want to do anything. However, on a school trip, we were taken to see a musical that produces at the Lyric Theatre. And it was so much fun that afterwards I just said, can can I just do that? So I very arbitrarily chose a career path based on the vague idea of fun. One of many dangerously arbitrary decisions that I probably shouldn't have made. But anyway, at the end of high school, I applied for a bunch of theatre courses and I got into a theatre design one. It was the first offer I received and it was in a rural city about six hours away from me. But I said, sure, I will change my entire life on a whim because this thing I think is fun. So I spent three years there learning how to do all sorts of funky crap like lighting, sound, costume, set, and I graduated with my lovely piece of paper. Then I moved back home to start my lifelong career as a professional escapist, because that's what I really loved about theater. It gave you the opportunity to say, you know what, I'm kind of tired of this reality thing. Let's build a new world to play around in and tell a story. And it didn't take too long to break into things because as soon as you know one person, you pretty much have a connection to everyone in Australian theater. So I started getting jobs as a lighting designer, stage manager, but predominantly as a technician and later a lighting programmer. I worked with some big companies on some amazing projects, one of which is the Opera in Sydney Harbour, where we literally build a stage on the harbour side and perform a show to a capacity of about 3,000 people, many of whom would travel to Australia just for this event. Really difficult work because there's, there's this weird thing that happens when you're outside, sometimes it rains, which then makes things wet. Things that perhaps shouldn't be wet, like say expensive lights, for example. But while it was very tiring, it was also very rewarding because I was doing the thing. I was making worlds come to life and it was fun for a while. Theater is, uh, well, it's kind of brutal because very rarely do you actually have a job. It's more like working as a contractor. You've got a series of gigs lined up. You might be on one show for a couple of weeks and then another for a couple of months, but very rarely will you be doing the same thing for more than three months in the Australian scene anyway, which causes a lot of anxiety because at any given time, you may or may not know if you're actually gonna be working this time next month, which leads to taking on a lot of jobs, some of which you may or may not want to do, but it's there, so you gotta grab it because there might not be anything if you don't. And this is especially especially true as a designer. For a while, I was genuinely gunning to make lighting design a full-time career. And that grind, that grind is rough. The opportunities are very minimal and you generally don't get to choose the show so much as the show chooses you. Because again, you can't afford to say no. It's another show to plonk on the old CV, get some fancy photos and hopefully lead to something bigger and better. And I guess I started to lose interest around 2015, 2016 because things weren't really going anywhere. As a technician, I very rapidly reached the ceiling of technical theater and unless you wanted to become like a touring head electrician or a venue manager, there's really not much avenue for growth, whether that be in what you're doing or how much money you're making. Like there are musicals I did in my early 20s with people in their 60s who were making the same money as me. And that was fine when I was younger, but then once you start accumulating things like rent, a wife, a dog, or any sort of ambition to do something in life, like say travel, all of a sudden making the exact same amount of money for the next 40 years that barely allows you to survive today is less than appealing. And by this time, I was also just kind of getting bored of theater. Before I said that one of the appeals was being able to create new worlds and stories. And the truth is that very little of theater is that thing I just said. The majority of shows I designed, for example, were in the realm of independent theater. And that is heavily saturated with social commentary. The sort of genre I like to call sit and chat theater. Shows about two people somehow ending up in the same room who probably have opposing political or some sort of moral viewpoints. We hear them argue for an hour to an hour and a half. One of them almost always kills the other and or themselves. Death is almost guaranteed. And if not, some sort of sour ending that leaves me having lost the will to live myself. But what's worse is that these shows often take place in the most boring locations you can imagine. Like say a living room. I cannot count the amount of shows I've designed that just take place in a living room. And honestly, there's only so many times that you can be asked to realistically light a living room before you start to get a bit sick of it. So in many ways, theater became the exact opposite of why I got into it. I did it to build new worlds and for some escapism. But what I found myself making was pure realism or hyper-realism. So essentially I was going into a theater to make 
a more potent experience of how shit reality is. Which yes, is a very important avenue of expression for a lot of artists, but for me, it was draining because I, I just wanted to do something cool. And yeah, there were and are a lot of companies I work with who try to inject a bit more magic into their shows, by which I mean using the medium of live performance to explore what only it can do, as opposed to just, you know, playing out reality in front of us. So after a while, I started to retreat heavily back into my hobbies of anime, manga, and gaming. And at the time I was watching a lot of YouTube. It had basically replaced television for me, still does. But I had a problem, that problem being that the series I loved the most being One Piece, there were no creators making One Piece on this platform that I wanted to watch for various reasons. So that combined with this desperate need for any kind of creative outlet, led me to make a channel. To do exactly what I wanted to do with theater, to escape. In this case, into the vast world of quirky fictional pirates. I never really anticipated anything to come of it. And after a long, long time, the channel did catch a little bit of traction. People were finding my videos and interacting with them in a positive way, which was, that was all, that was wow. <laughs> because I'm not used to that. Usually when you talk to someone in a foyer after they've seen your show, it's more in depth discussion about all of the powerful ideas and the things. But on YouTube, people were just saying, dude, hey, I love fictional pirates as well. Good, good job. And it was just so simple and beautiful and easy. So I continued doing that alongside working full time in theater until I eventually uh, kind of destroyed myself. There came a point where I was working full time on another outdoor opera, but in addition to that, I was also designing a show in another theater. And on top of that, I was making three YouTube videos a week. So my schedule was something like this. I'd wake up, I'd go to the theater where I was designing a show, spend pretty much all my day there until around 4 p.m. and then leave for my opera job, which was about 5 p.m. till 3 a.m. Because being outdoors, we couldn't really do much with the lights unless it was dark. So we needed to be there at really stupid times to plot. Now, after that, I would go back to the first theater where I was designing a show, edit and post a YouTube video, and then fall asleep on one of their couches for a couple of hours before needing to wake up again. And I did that for about a week straight. My wife literally did not not see me a week. And I was, I was pretty broken after that. The show I designed turned out to be <laughs> utter garbage. The opera I was doing was, it was not the greatest thing we've ever done. And the quality of my YouTube videos, well, firstly, they were garbage by default because these were the very early days, but even more garbage than the usual garbage. And I knew that this was the point where I needed to change something. Not immediately because I still needed jobs and money to live. So what I decided to let go of was lighting design because it took too much time, it paid next to nothing. And the only opportunity it gave me was this endless supply of wonderful living rooms. And a while later, I got a long-term gig working on the Book of Mormon in Sydney. This was very notable because I was on it for almost a year, which is very rare. But this is the show that told me that I just needed to stop doing theater altogether. Not because it was bad, but in fact, quite the opposite. The Book of Mormon is a fantastic show. There were amazing people working on it alongside me. And you know what? It even paid pretty damn well. Plus my wife was on the show, so we got to see each other every day and it sounds pretty perfect. And yet I was, well, it was just miserable. And so so it became clear that if I can't work under these conditions, then there is nothing that is gonna make it better. And by that point, I was just so drained by theater that I just didn't care anymore. Instead of giving 110%, that became 100%. And over the course of the show, it even dropped to 90 or even 80%. And it got to the point where I would just find any excuse to work on YouTube stuff. During shows, when I wasn't operating the lighting desk, I would just be sitting backstage writing or editing videos on my laptop in between floor cues. There also came a point where I just stopped talking to people on the show in favor of plonking myself in a corner and continuing to make videos. And by this time, Grand Line Review was kind of taking off. We were at about 50,000 subscribers and it was looking like this thing could be something. So I think I was desperately trying to cultivate that because this was the chance that I needed. My theater skills do not translate to anything except theater. So I was very adamant on trying to open up this new avenue. And eventually that magic moment came. I qualified for the YouTube AdSense program and all of a sudden I had income from my fictional pirate videos. After about three years of making them, this effort was starting to pay off, quite literally. So as soon as my contract on the Book of Mormon finished, I essentially said no more theater and practically quit the industry, which was stupidly risky in context, but in retrospect, also incredibly well-timed. As not too long after we got hit by this whole pandemic business and every theater related project in Australia was shut down pretty much overnight. Now by that time, I'd been dedicating myself to YouTube for a full six months or so. And so surprisingly, I still had a job, which is more than I can say for I think literally anyone else I knew at the time. It is very risky though, because even to this day, my YouTube career could be over in an instant. I could get copyright struck and have everything taken down. So it's not at all a stable profession, but hey, neither was theater apparently. Despite the constant stress of copyright claims and keeping up with the ever-changing algorithm, YouTube is, uh, it's shockingly more stable than theater. Especially because when 2020 came in, we were all shown just how expendable we are in the arts because we were legit the very first people shut down and unemployed. So even if YouTube does come to an end for me one day, I still
still don't think I'll be going back to theater. I did have a lot of great experiences and most of the friends that I know today come from theater. In fact, so does my wife. I met my wife doing a show, but it's just too unstable, too low paying and too unsatisfying for me personally. I should say that right now I still design shows as a hobby for a few very rare people, but otherwise I'm pretty thrilled to call myself retired from that whole life venture. And now I get to pursue the career of being a professional dude in a room. <laughs> what a cool story, past Liam. But now it's time for me, present Liam. I'm just here to record an extra five seconds or so because I think that videos look a lot better when their time is about 10 minutes than they do at nine minutes 55. I'm also using this as an excuse to use red. I don't use red often because it looks a bit oppressive and evil and maybe even a bit sex dungeon-y. 